we're continuing our series on the Sermon on the Mount, and um, I want to start today just kind of with a quirky news story. I don't know if you like those quirky news stories, but but I totally get a kick out of them because I'm amazed at humankind. <laughs> and um, and uh, I want to uh, bring up a little picture, and um, Lonnie Holloway of Saluda, South Carolina, passed away after 90 great years, but he was very clear about uh, how he wanted his service to look. And um, he was a hunter. He loved to, to cruise the town in his 1973 green Pontiac. And uh, he loved his wife, so he wanted to be buried in his Pontiac with his guns in the trunk, rolling the plot right next to his wife uh, with a $100 bill in his pocket. All right. All right. <laughs> That's how it's done right there. So I love this guy. He's fantastic. Um, but I, I just got a kick out of the story. You can take it down, by the way. I got a kick out of the story because it, it showed what he loved. Like, he was very, very clear about what he was about and, and the things that he was passionate about. And um, I find myself asking this week as I kind of considered the text we're going to dive into and as I looked at that story, um, what's our treasure? What do we value deep down inside? And maybe it's not getting buried in a car with guns in the back, but what is it that we want to be remembered for? What is it that uh, when people look back on our life, you want them to go, man, that, that's what they were about. That's their thing. Um, it's a question of, of what are we focused on? What are we passionate about? What what's What is it we're pursuing in this life? And... Um, Matthew six nineteen through 24 is what we're going to look at. And if you have uh, a Bible, feel free to start flipping to that or open up your app or whatnot. But as we get there, I kind of want to share about the series that we've been on. Um, Sermon on the Mount, for me, these past couple months has really been um, something of a mirror. I kind of got into it thinking, this is really clear, tangible stuff, and God's going to tell me what I should be doing and... and uh, and what I found was that it, re it really felt like it was a reflection. Um, it gave me a chance to glimpse God, and it gave me a chance to glimpse myself, and then to, to maybe figure out, is there some area that I need to make a shift? Um, you know, some mornings I'm running really late, and I scramble, and I get out of the house. Um, guys have seen me on Wednesday morning, and uh, and my hair is a mess, and I don't even know it, but I got like a big tuft sticking up like right here, and I think I look fine. I'm just cruising along. <laughs> Um, but then I'm like getting back in my car and I see my reflection there on the, on the car uh, window and I go, man, whoa, I look horrible right now. I need to shave. I need to make some serious adjustments. And the Sermon on the Mount has, has done that for me these past few months. Um, and then this week it got really poignant for me as, as um, I saw the news about Paris and Beirut. Um, love your enemies and be salt and light, and suddenly um, I'm thinking about how I could respond instead of just how I naturally knee-jerk respond to things. So that's kind of the attitude that I hope that we can take as we sit before this text, that we're going to do what Jesus' followers did. We're going to sit down on this hillside, and we're going to listen to what Jesus has to say, and he's going to say some words, and, and then we'll see if we need to make any adjustments in our lives. So... Let me read the text for us. Matthew 6, 19 through 24. Jesus says this. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. If your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. And if then the light within you is a darkness, how great is that darkness? <clears throat> no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. But you can't serve both God and money. Let's pray. God, we humbly put ourselves... Uh, for you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for this church family and the, the fun that we have together. And Lord, mm -hmm. teach us now. We open up our lives to you. Amen. Mm -hmm. 
So as I read this passage, it's about what we treasure. Um, we were talking about this at Men's Bible Study on Wednesday. Um, what do we want out of our life? What are we pursuing? What do you uh, want your life to look like? What brings you happiness and joy? Um, what do you consider valuable? What's worth focusing on? And in that last verse, I think Jesus brings up an easy target of our focus so that we can connect it to our lives, um, which is which is money. So let's consider with let's start with that. I think it's an easy target, easy place to kind of put legs on this thing. Um, money is an easy target because I think for most of us, if we felt like we had a little bit more of it, that sounds appealing. Um, I know that does for me. Uh, if we had a little bit more, maybe we could do a little bit more. And I don't think most people just love having money for money's sake, but uh, maybe it means more time with your family, or maybe it means the opportunity to be more generous, or um, uh, maybe if we if we had more money, that kind of shows us where we're at in, in terms of our, our status or our career life. I know as I think about career, money kind of sits up there as one of the main reasons to go to work and to, to keep trying to get that next promotion. And um, maybe it's just the freedom and security that we can get from it. And uh, I was chatting with my brother recently, and we were talking about the lottery of all things. And, and he was saying, if I'm on the lottery, it'd be fantastic because it would solve so many problems for me. He's got kids in college. I mean... Just knock that out, and then uh, he could go live the good life and, and do basically what he wanted. And I was sharing with him that I don't think I want to win the lottery. I think that I would not know what to do with all that money, and um, I'd probably make some poor choices in my life with it. It would screw me all up. I'd start prioritizing things that weren't important. And um, then I'd get accosted by everybody who had a need, and I, I stink at saying no. Christina can attest to this. So I'd end up like... Everybody would just showed up and you know, just be gone. Um, and uh, and I said, you wouldn't know who to trust. And he goes, well, maybe you're right, but I'd sure like to give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. There it is. Um, it's funny, though. This passage, uh, nowhere in the passage, nowhere in Jesus' ministry that I know of does he talk about um, poverty is something to aspire to or uh, great wealth is something to aspire to. As a matter of fact, I think it has very little issue with how much money you have, whether you're rich or poor. Um, what's at the heart of this text is who do we serve? What are we about? What do we love and care about? And what guides our life? And what sort of decisions does that turn into? And Jesus says, uh, you can't serve both God and money, but that could have been God and anything else. Um, you'll end up prioritizing one or the other. And the problem that it points out, um, the thing that, that it brings up is that at some point, what we pursue, what we value, what we decide is important, um, that thing that we focus on, we're going to serve it at some level. It's going to um, dictate our decisions. So what treasure do we serve? What are the things that we treasure? And I notice as I think about this in terms of just calendar life, um, what are the things that I serve? And I find myself serving all sorts of weird things in my life. Like, I'd like to say that it's all about the Lord. And, uh, but I also notice that I care deeply about winning my fantasy football league. So <laughs> if I look at who do I serve with what hours, uh, there, there comes a time where I'm like, I want to dedicate some time to making sure my lineup is just right so that I can meet my friends. Um, <laughs> Working out, having a nice wine collection, obligations to people. Oh, being liked. There's one of mine. I've already told you about that one. Being liked can dictate some decisions for me. I'm working on it. It's a growing edge for me. Um, there's treasures that we give ourselves to. It's the nature of it. We'll sacrifice time and energy, and we will pursue this thing. So it's important we choose what we treasure wisely. And I think that's why Jesus says the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body's going to be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, the whole body will be full of darkness. And if your light within you is a darkness, how great is that darkness? And now I kind of interpret that as, um, if I'm focused on good things, if I'm focused on the stuff that the Lord wants me to be focused on, if I'm, I'm focused on loving God more and, and loving my family and caring for the poor and advocating for those in need, um, I can't help but be blessed and be a blessing. I can't help but have light uh, pervade in my life. Um, 
But if my eyes are focused on something that's not good, that's not going to produce light in my life or in the world, I can't help but get darker. And um, I kind of get this darkness thing. I don't know if I've ever shared this with y'all, but um, I sometimes struggle with depression. And I, I affectionately, not so affectionately, call it my cave. I can, I can end up in my cave, and I kind of, it's this mindset where I'm looking around at the world and I'm going, man, there's so much wrong. There's wrong stuff that's wrong in me. There's stuff that's wrong everywhere. It just makes me want to curl up in a little ball. And if I stay there, and that's what I'm focused on for that however long, um, <laughs> it's amazing. My life just gets darker and darker, and then I need other people to yank me out of it. Um, it's the opposite of Thanksgiving I was thinking about. Thanksgiving is coming up. And on Thanksgiving, we sort of pause for a minute and we go, what has God done? What? What? What am I blessed with? And, and we focus on what's been given to us. And we can't help but feel lighter after we do it. We can't help but recognize that there's that God's light is among us. The principle is simply this. Whatever our focus is, whatever our treasure is, whatever we pour our time, energy, and pursuit into, it's going to shape our hearts. It's going to produce something. It's going to build something in our life. And will that be something good? Or will it be something destructive? Or will it just be something that's somewhere in the neutral? Um, I think that's up to us. Will it be God's kingdom or our kingdom? Um, and this is really one of the tricky parts as I go, what does it mean to call Jesus Lord? If we, if we say that Jesus is our Lord, at some level it feels like we're saying we trust you, Lord, and that you maybe are better at getting us to good things than we are. Now, that gets really complicated when it comes to real life decisions, and I don't know what stuff you've had in your life, but I can remember one particular season in my life where um, I was working at UPC with college students. I loved doing college ministry and connecting with those students, and I was cranking away at seminary. I responded to God's kind of call to become a pastor, and, and I thought, okay, this is where I need to go, and I, and I did good at school. I was really good at school. I liked school. I liked writing papers and learning stuff, and um, thought I was a pretty smart cat, and I thought I had a really good focus, and I had this focus of becoming the best pastor that I could be. Um, the only challenge with this was this happened after I had already gotten married, and um, I, I treasured my job, and I treasured my school, um, and somewhere in the middle of that, I had forgotten and um, wasn't treasuring my wife so good, and this darkness began to creep in. Um, I wasn't focused on the right things. And thankfully, I had a wonderful counselor who showed up. Even more thankfully, I have an incredibly patient, loving wife who stuck around. And um, it took me a bit, but I figured out I need to drop UBC, serving college students right now, um, in order to be focused on the things that God wants to be focused on. And that's the question that I think this text brings to us. Is where do we need to make an adjustment? Is there something that... We need to say, you know what? This isn't my shape in my life in the right direction right now. It's not what the Lord wants, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna not do that, even though it might be a really good thing, and I'm gonna do this instead. Jesus knows that what we treasure and what we focus on is gonna shape our life. It'll shape our hearts, it'll shape our minds, it'll shape our decisions. And Jesus warns us that there's dangers if we overvalue the wrong things. Some stuff has not in the principle of decay, the stuff of this, this world, the stuff of this life. Uh, we're coming up on Black Friday. I know it's a high holiday in some homes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that sweet computer that I am looking at purchasing on Black Friday, if I can get a good enough deal, it's going to be obsolete in about two years. Um, clothes wear out, fashions change. Starbucks grows cold in about an hour. The newest cell phone is worn out in about the same amount of time. So <laughs> um, it's easy to get caught up in it all. But what does it look like if we make this holiday season a season where we get caught up in what's eternal? Something that lasts. Because if we put our hope and our joy and our satisfaction in something that's not going to last, we will get it. We will get a passing sense of satisfaction that will fleet. That will be fleeting and will go away just as quick. Um, 
And if we wrap ourselves up in the things that are eternal, I think we'll get that too. We'll find a rich and abundant life that God wants for us to have. There's an old legend about the disciple Thomas. And um, after his resurrection, he's uh, thought to be the disciple who brought the gospel to India. And uh, there's this story about a, um, a guy in India who was kind of a king, and, and he was praying for, uh, for the Lord to send him somebody to build a palace. And the Lord sent Thomas to him. And he showed up, and he said, I'm the one that the Lord has sent. So the guy said, well, here's a ton of money I want you to build. Um, a palace. I'm going on a trip, and when I come back, I'd love to see it. So Thomas took all that money and immediately started caring for the poor. And when the guy came back, of course, he was very angry, uh, nothing to show for it. So the king threw him in prison and was trying to figure out a fitting way for him to die. And that night, um, the king's brother died and then uh, was raised from the dead and came to the king and said, you wouldn't believe what I saw in heaven. There was this amazing mansion. And on it, it said, Architect Thomas. And then it said, For your name. Um, and the king rushed to free Thomas and asked him uh, what he had done in, with all of that money. And he, he, he said it was better to have a palace there than to have a palace here. Now, I can question the theology or the truth of that particular story. But I think the point is the same. Um, what sort of life are we building? What sort of things are we building with our lives? What, what palace are we going to build towards? What's the ripple that goes out from our lives? It's a question of focus. There's nothing wrong with stuff. There's nothing wrong with clothes or with phones or with bank accounts. Um, but do we overvalue them sometimes? Do they end up a distraction uh, from where we really want to head. Christina and I go grocery shopping, and I don't have near the stamina that she does. She <laughs> likes to go down every aisle. I have a list, three things. Those are the three things I plan to get and be out of there as quickly as possible. So what usually happens is we're grocery shopping together, and uh, I inevitably will pull out my phone, and I'll start texting people or playing <laughs> word with friends or um, any number of things. And um, i got to tell you, I don't even realize it, but all of a sudden I'm going half as fast. I'm like in the way of somebody's cart. Christina's pulling me out of the way of the Oreos display that I'm about to totally destroy. <laughs> because I'm distracted. I'm, I'm focused on this, but I'm trying to go over here. And it just doesn't work. It's even scarier when I'm texting while driving a train and stuff. Um, <laughs> Lord, thanks for those angels. Confession time, I guess. Um, but if we treasure something and we focus on it, and that's where we head, um, I think we're going to get it. And we'll get good things if we focus on the Lord. Things that can't fade, things that can't be taken away. Second Timothy 6, 6 and 7 puts it this way. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, we can't take anything out of it. So if we have food and clothing, let's be content with that. Huh. Godliness with contentment. That's what he was pursuing. The rest was all details. That sort of spirit, that spirit of contentment and thanksgiving, uh, that can be a treasure. Uh, that's a treasure that doesn't fade. Verse 21 of the passage we're looking at puts it this way, where your treasure is, your heart will be. A treasure is, is having something incredibly valuable, and it varies from person to person. Uh, my treasure might be that Star Wars figurine collection. It's not, thankfully. You don't have to worry about me there. But, uh, <laughs> but it, let's say you did highly treasure those things. Um, everybody chooses what they're going to treasure. But if we don't treasure the right things, um, if we don't treasure things that wear well and lead to a good life, uh, it's going to cost us. And I think that's what Jesus is watching out for us with this passage with. It shapes our heart, our mind, and our will. <laughs> and to me, that's grace. It's amazing to me that there is a God who loves us, creates us, would lay down his very life to open a door for us to be with him, um, knows that we are built for relationship with him, and at the end of the day says, I love you enough to set you free, so you choose. Choose where you will put your life. Um, 
It's a crazy thing. The stakes are high, and yet God loves us enough to say, you choose. And each of us has that throne in our hearts, or that altar in our hearts, and we can put any number of stuff on it. Um, but when we put the Lord there, beautiful things happen. Working with college students, there was always this moment, sophomore year, I think, right between sophomore and junior year, and the question finally came up, and it actually mattered, what's your major? Like, everyone asked you that when you're about to go into college, um, and you're like, I don't know, I'll, just, I'll say something. Um, but now it actually mattered, because you're done with your basic classes, and, and you've really got to actually carve out what you're going to spend your money on, and what classes you're going to take for the next two and a half years. And if you hate numbers and money, and you sign up to be an accountant, and you're an accounting major, ugh, it's going to be misery. Misery for a couple of years, and then misery for however many years you do that job. Um, but if you love caring for people, or caring for the sick, and, and medicine is uh, fascinating to you, then becoming a nurse during that time can be incredibly rich. Like, this is condensed learning. It's time that you can focus on what you're good at, what you're passionate about. You can grow so much in it, and then you can go do it for a while. And... Um, and I feel like that's what this passage is doing, is it's asking us, again, at whatever stage of life we're in, saying, you've got grace. Today's brand new. The Lord loves you, and what do you want to major in? What do you want to major in? What do you want to major in for this month, or the rest of this year, or the next couple of years? And the crazy thing is, we get to choose, and then our hearts go there. Or your treasure is there, your heart will be also. Um... With Jana beginning to uh, look at what she's going to be doing in January and leaving, she was the connection with the preschool, and um, so I decided to volunteer down there. And um, for me, it was a totally logical decision. I'm like, I want a relationship with those teachers. I probably should be connected if I'm going to uh, be helping with that. And so, um, so I volunteered to go down there every Thursday and hang out with two to four year olds. They're pretty darn cute. They're also little German monsters. Terrible. <laughs> um, but I just went down there. And now the crazy thing is, my heart's beginning to go there too. Um, I find myself staying up at night trying to figure out how I can make my obstacle course that I do on Thursdays with the kids even better. Um, I wander through the grocery store and I see little kid snacks down on that bottom aisle and I'm like, hmm, I wonder if that'd be a good thing to donate. Is that healthy enough? <laughs> These are not questions Christina and I normally consider. Um, <clears throat> like I, I, I pray for those little ramens and the, their parents and stuff and I'm like, what is going on? Well, one of my treasures, my time began to get put there and now it's shaping my life. <clears throat> And my guess is it's similar for you, where your money, where your time, where your passion gets put, you're going to begin to find your heart go there. So be careful what you choose to treasure. It'll produce something in your life. Like I said, we have grace for today. We get a new start each day out of it. The Lord gives us that, gives us freedom to choose. And um, that's a great relief because there are times that I don't choose the right things. And that means that I get another day to choose, again, where I'm going to put my treasure, where I'm going to put my focus, what I'm going to pursue. Um, and each decision um, sort of builds momentum in my life. And each choice can produce something beautiful. Um, I want to end with a quick story. J.D. Rockefeller, late 1800s, early 1900s, um, was known for, um, he's an oil guy, but he was known for giving vast amounts of money to education and public health. Um, he was a committed Christian who uh, believed that uh, giving at least 10% of what he had was, was how he wanted to do life. And um, at some point he was asked how he could have given away so much money. Like how do you bring yourself to give away millions and millions of dollars? And um, he said, you know, I never would have been able to do it. Uh, I wouldn't have been able to give away a tenth of my first million dollars if I hadn't given away the first 15 cents I'd gotten on that dollar fifty salary that I had. He discovered something, that there's a power of consistently making a decision towards a certain treasure, his treasure of generosity, of honoring God. And that was, that was kind of what he chose, and it, it shaped his heart and his mind and his life. And um, over a long period of time, it resulted in a certain place.
And I think that if we treasure the things of God, if we treasure loving God and loving other people, our heart will expand and we'll get even more capacity to love. And if we treasure just um, stuff for ourselves or um, other things, we're going to find our heart shrinking. And we're not going to find ourselves um, being able to love like that. So, this week, you'll get a lot of moments. This month, you'll get a lot of moments. You'll get a lot of decisions. Um, and they might be little. Do you tip the Starbucks person or not? Uh, but in those moments, you choose what you treasure. And what you treasure will shape your life. And um, the Lord cares deeply about you having a good life. He cares deeply about it. And so, um, I think he opens this door. It's not about what we're supposed to be doing as much as it is about God saying, hey, i got a great life for you. Do you want to come and enjoy it with me? So let's pray. Lord, um, thank you. Thank you for this text. Thank you for this um, Sermon on the Mount that you gave us. Thank you for challenging us to consider what it is that we treasure. And then to try to figure out how to put that into action. God, shape our lives. Help us to do it. We're not so great at doing it on our own, so we're thankful for you as our Savior who gives us grace and our Lord who directs our lives. So keep doing it, Lord. You're good to us. We love you. Amen. Amen.